I'm going to turn things over to Brooke to introduce our guest. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Brooke Keeney, and I'm the managing editor for Birds of the World. And I just want to say it's so cool to see people in the chat coming from all over the world. So um, <clears throat> I'm very happy to introduce you to our special guest today, Dr. Stephen Debus. Steve is an ornithologist from New South Wales, Australia, and an associate editor for Birds of the World. Steve's been interested in raptors since childhood and has researched and published on a variety of Australian species, with a special focus on diurnal raptors and owls. He's a very prolific author and has written around 150 papers and several books or book chapters, mainly on raptors. He was the editor-in-chief of the journal Australian Field Ornithology for more than 30 years and also edited the BirdLife Australia Raptor Group's newsletter, Boo Book, for stints of 10 and 15 years. His many publications include The Owls of Australia, A Field Guide to Australian Nightbirds, and three editions of the award-winning Birds of Prey of Australia, A Field Guide. His latest book, Australian Falcons, Ecology, Behavior, and Conservation, was published in 2022, which we highly recommend for anyone with an interest in this fascinating group of birds. Steve has also written numerous species accounts for the Handbook of Australian, New Zealand, and Antarctic Birds, also known as Hansab, as well as for the Handbook of Birds of the World and, of course, Birds of the World. His most recent work with Birds of the World is an upcoming series of ID-focused articles for Australian raptors. He also recently wrote the Birds of the World species accounts for Little Eagle, Grey Falcon, and Black Falcon, which is the focus of today's webinar. As a companion to this webinar, the Black Falcon species account on Birds of the World is currently free for anyone to access if you'd like to follow along during the webinar or dive in deeper afterwards. This free access will be available until January 31st. So with that, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Debus, who will give us a special window into the life history of the charismatic Black Falcon. And I will just note Steve is having a few technical difficulties, so I believe he's going to try and keep his camera off. Um, but otherwise, thank you, Steve. We look forward to hearing more about Black Falcons. Uh, thanks very much, Brooke. Uh, I'd like to start with um, thank yous, of course, to the uh, Birds of the World team. I'm afraid I have to apologise for some technical difficulties here. We had an electrical storm last night and I keep getting a message on the screen saying um, I've got low bandwidth or um, a unstable internet. So we'll proceed. And um, perhaps, Jessica, can you let me know if people can hear me? Yep, everyone can hear you just fine. Because uh, I'm afraid Brooke was breaking up quite a lot there. I couldn't hear some of what Brooke was saying. But anyway, we'll proceed and hope you can hear me. Um, I'll I'll stop my video and concentrate on the uh, on the sound. So um, more on birds of the world. I'd like to just say that it's a great resource and it, and it's being constantly revised and updated. So um, in a lot of cases, for a lot of species, it's it's one of those uh, places where you go to for the latest information. And so thanks to the team. Um, I'd like to welcome people that are that are joining this webinar and say that um, I'm happy for it to be interactive. Um, so I'm quite happy to stop for any questions um, along the way. And again, I might have to ask Jessica or, uh, to um, to let me know if there's any questions because I um, yeah, I've got the video off. So um, yeah, quite happy for questions along the way. Um, so just to introduce the Black Falcon, um, it's uh, the, the recent DNA evidence shows that it's one of the higher falcon group or otherwise known as the great or desert falcons. Um, so its relatives include the, the Lana and the uh, Lagger uh, of India, which is its closest relative, and the Jura falcon and Saker falcon. So it's one of those, um, yeah, birds, large falcons or large, medium to large falcons of, of open country uh, um, and, and quite arid environments. Um, so I guess I'll say why I got interested in studying black falcons. It's um it's a little studied uh, raptor, but it's and it's pretty uncommon, but it's one of those special Australian endemics that doesn't occur anywhere else. Um, and it's declining uh, in 
parts of southeastern Australia. Um, so it's declared vulnerable um, in New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. And uh, it's had a, a bit of a history of being overshadowed shadowed by the peregrine because uh, the peregrine seems to be much more charismatic and well-known. And also black falcons are often confused with dark coloured brown falcons, um, which are a common sort of roadside uh, raptor that's kind of like an oversized kestrel in many ways. But the, um, the black falcon is, is quite different um, in character anyway. So I started off studying um, black falcons as, as sort of a voluntary unfunded um, study um, in which many colleagues uh, joined in at various stages. Um, uh, people like uh, David Whelan and Bernie McRitchie were um, uh, colleagues studying black falcons um, and Leah Sang. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the late Jerry Olson was involved. Um, and then finally, um, an honours student at the University of New England, Alice Bauer, um, wanted to do a project on black falcons. So we, we joined forces and I was able to find her a few nests. And, um, and uh, Fred Van Gessel joined in as a sound recorder. So we got some audio of their calls as well. And um, I had another colleague, David Charlie, who studied them on the coast fairly close to me. Um, so yeah, it was a big collaborative effort. Um, and there are other names mentioned if people refer to the Birds of the World account, they'll, they'll, you'll see that there are many um, colleagues that uh, contributed in various ways to watching black falcon nests, They're mainly observational studies and um, dietary analyses uh, at the time, mostly in the early days anyway, by um, the late Tony Rose, who was uh, an associate of the Australian Museum, but, but did uh, dietary analyses basically for the love of it. Um, so yeah, uh, it was yeah a big collaborative effort is what I'm trying to say. Um, uh, here I'm going to mostly follow the sort of the birds of the world account in terms of um, aspects of the life history of the black falcon, um, and people can refer to that account for more detail. But uh, as I said, it's a medium to large falcon. The male weighs about. 600 grams in round figures, the female about 850 grams. So it's similar body size to peregrine, um, but it's got larger wings and tail, um, and much bigger sort of sail area. Um, it occurs over quite a lot of the um, non-forested uh, parts of Australia, open habitats, um, rather than the rugged forested country. So it's, it's for example, in um, agricultural or rural environments and grasslands and so on, step to sort of semi-desert and water courses in the arid zone and even on the tropical floodplains, open floodplains. Um, so, yeah, it's well distributed, but uh, generally in areas of sort of the lowest human population density in, in Australia, most people are around the coast, but the black falcon's sort of an inland bird that does get to the coast in open environments. Um so on to its movements, um, there's been no radio tracking or satellite tracking of black falcons, so there's not enough known about the movements of black falcons, but they're certainly capable of continental scale migration or other movements um, where eruptions, depending on seasonal conditions um, and food supply. So they, they are capable of moving around a lot, but there are also resident breeding pairs, at least in the temperate sort of southeastern agricultural belt, um, it seems like the same birds are in the same territories for you know a few years running at least as far as we can tell um <clears throat> and they can and soar and and travel effortlessly like i said they have a large sail area large wings and tail so they're very good at soaring and and spend a long time on the wing um just soaring on thermals um if there are no questions at this point i'll um, move on to food and hunting um, they have a very diverse diet, so they eat anything from you know, birds, you know, small mammals, reptiles, insects, which they catch in flight, um, a bit of carrion. They'll come to roadkill at times. Um, and uh, <clears throat> they're also pretty good at robbing other other raptors. So there's there's a bird there in, in pursuit mode, um, pretty spectacular when they um, want to fly quickly. Um, 
but like I said, they spend a lot of time soaring. Oh, there's one catching a quail. Yeah, they say that that's um, probably been flushed by something, or maybe the falcon itself. Um, so they they um they spend a lot of time searching from the air, like from a soaring position, or they also fly low at um, fast contour hunting at low level. They'll stoop at prey or chase it or, or flush it from from the grass or from other cover. Uh, males and females will cooperate in, um, like members of a pair will cooperate to catch prey. Um, and they're a real strategist. Um, they use what's termed mediated flushing. They'll follow farm machinery or vehicles or livestock being moved or even emus. I've, I've seen them, one following an emu and catching the insects that it flushed as it was walking. Um, harriers, they're good at following harriers and um, taking advantage of anything a harrier will flush. Um, fire, they'll come to fire, whether it's a, a stubble burn on, on a crop field or um, other other sources of fire um, that flushes out prey. And um, shooters, they'll follow shooters and, and catch um, wounded prey. Um, so I, I think this strategy is all to do with the fact that they live in a pretty harsh environment and they, they've got to take advantage of, of the way they, yeah, any way they can catch um, prey. And there's one robbing a, a black-shouldered kite. They're pretty good at robbing other raptors and, and um, the black-shouldered kites caught a mouse, it's likely to get robbed um, by a black falcon if one's in the area and watching a hunting kite or any other raptor for that matter, um, or small to medium anyway, um, raptor. Hi, Steve. Um, yep, sure. Yeah, so so Andrew in the chat or in the Q&A asked, uh, do black falcons stoop as fast as peregrines? And uh, I'd like to just add on to that. Like you made a comparison between black falcon and peregrine falcons in sort of shape and uh, style. Like it, are there a lot of similarities in how they fly and how they hunt there? Or are there differences between those species? Yeah, there, there are differences. Nobody's done the sort of aerodynamic comparison that's been done in Africa. I think it was, um, yeah, um, Lana and, and um, peregrines in Africa. The black falcon is more like a Lana, um, so not as fast. I mean, Jerry Olson said that, um, yeah, black falcons are not as, as fast or as strong. On them. I mean, they will stoop, but they, they, they don't give that really sort of fast um, peregrine-type stoop. Um, yeah, I, I think it's to do with their, their sort of larger wings and tail and softer plumage and so on. They're, they're not geared to the sort of real bullet type stoops that peregrines do, but um, they're more manoeuvrable near the ground, so they can they can catch prey on the ground. They can actually dive to the ground and and grab something off the ground, or as a peregrine, really is too fast and heavy to do that. Um, yeah, so they they do differ, but it would be great to see a comparative um, study done i think um it was andrew jenkins in africa was we had trackers on satellite trackers on um on peregrines and lanners and I, I think peregrines were 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 quite a lot faster um and uh, I, we've had a couple of uh measurements of peregrine stoop speeds in australia i think they're uh, upwards of 170 kilometers an hour um i think there was one an amazing one that was up to around 250 kilometers an hour mark um, a rehab bird. Um, yeah, so th there are differences that will be well worth studying, but but people ought to think of the black falcon as more like a lanner or, or, or a lagger or um, maybe a bit like a saker for those that know sakers, but it doesn't hover for ground mammals like a saker does, though. Great. Right, thank you. We, ac we actually have a... I hope that answers the question. Hmm. Yeah. We have uh, several questions in the chat now about this topic. It seems that people are pretty interested. Right. So the next yeah. question would be uh, uh, from Nathan in the Q&A. Uh, does their hunting behavior, you know, like lower to the ground and less of a fast stoop like a peregrine, like you were saying, does does they, do these hunting behaviors make them more susceptible to collisions with buildings like wind turbines or other things? Yeah, um, fences fences are the problem in in farming areas. Barbed wire fences. Um, yeah, there's there's not many records of them colliding with wind turbines yet, but but um, wind farms are, are sort of um, yeah starting to grow in number in Australia now. But I imagine the the number of collisions will increase as the number of wind farms increases. But 
but low level stuff uh yeah fences and and vehicles that they get hit by cars and they and they certainly collide with fences and they do some pretty severe damage so to themselves so there's actually for their abundance there's a pretty high rate of rescue but but low success for with rehab because most most of the birds that uh get injured by hitting a fence like the one you can see in the photo there that the top wire would often be barbed in australia so um a lot of the um collision victims unfortunately have to be put down because they're they're too uh, severely damaged to um have any hope of rehab and and generally australian governments various state governments and so on are a bit averse to keeping permanent care raptors so yeah they they do suffer collisions especially low level ones mm. right well not great but thank you for that answer and we have a few more questions about their their sort of hunting styles so another question for you is um what what size birds are black falcons usually successfully hunting and uh our uh, follow-up to that is uh are black falcons as agile as say a goshawk when they're hunting birds um well the the maximum sort of size bird they've they've um been known to catch is sort of a, a waterfowl like duck or something or a small heron uh, up to about a thousand grams but the most common prey that i've um from our dietary studies uh are sort of in the starling um feral pigeon um galah sort of size range um you can see a couple of galahs in that right hand photo there they're they're a, a small cockatoo um uh they're about 350 grams or so feral pigeons are around about around about that or to 400 grams um corellas they do take little corellas which are a, a slightly larger cockatoo up to about the sort of five or six hundred gram range but but they're, yeah, they're most common sort of prey. And a stubble quail was about 100 grams. Those quail, they like quail. And so starlings are a bit under 100 grams. So a lot of their prey is, um, yeah, maybe about a quarter of the weight of the falcon or commonly. But, yeah, they have quite a range of, of prey sizes. I mean, some shorebirds are in the sort of up to sort of two or 300 grams. I guess um, masked lapwings are a fairly solid sort of shorebird. Um and as far as the the hunting methods, yeah, they're they're certainly more agile near the ground than than um, a peregrine. But I'm not sure about goshawks. They they will chase prey in and around vegetation. I, 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 yeah, but um, yeah, whether they're as good as a goshawk, uh, I think the, the the different wing shape might mean they're not quite that agile. They generally prefer to take prey in flight or but they can pounce to the ground to take things but i don't think they plunge into vegetation as much as a, a goshawk would and they generally don't occur in um um habitats um dense habitats like dense wooded habitats so yeah that they, they, they occur where the trees are fairly sparse as, as a rule mm. Great, thank you. Well, okay, are we ready? To, can we move on, or, or do yeah, people yeah, let's, happy let's with that? move on for now, and then we'll we'll get some more questions later. Yeah, okay. Um, oh, I wasn't going to go into much detail about voice because there's recordings on the um on the Birds of the World webpage, but they, they're typical large falcon calls like cackling and and creaking and whining and so on, which is a begging call. But they're a bit. The, a lot of the calls are less strident than a peregrine, and um, um the cackling call is generally a bit slower than a peregrine but um the examples are on the on the web page now um so i'll move on to a bit of behavior um they're, they're pretty strongly territorial and, and defend the nest and so on quite strongly against other black falcons and against other raptors and particularly wedge-tailed eagles they, they um in the, in the nestling period they they really don't like wedge-tailed eagles within about a kilometer of the nest so they'll go up and chase them away um they can be a bit social at times uh, like they'll, they'll gather this one of their other strategies is they they're quite happy to gather at a fire like you can sometimes see multiple black falcons gathering i think i forget what the highest number of birds gathered at a say a fire is but it's upwards of a dozen i think um but often you know several anyway um or at 
concentrations or plagues of prey, they'll, they'll come to a mouse plague or, or a locust plague or something. And um, <clears throat> yeah, a lot of their courtship is aerial. They, they have various uh, courtship aerial maneuvers that include, you know, fast chases and things like that, male and female. And, and um, yeah, so um, yeah, pretty spectacular courtship flights. Um, as far as we know, they're monogamous for, you know, several seasons in a, in a row, um, as long as one of them or the other survives. Um, but they'll find a new mate if, if one of them dies. Um, and at least in the temperate zone where, where I work, there's some evidence um, of, of them occupying the same territory um, year on year. But where they go between breeding events is a bit of an unknown. Yet um, some of the females seem to disperse for the autumn and for a while and then come back at the start of the breeding season. Um, they um, uh, yeah, David just said about 20 seen in a controlled burn. Yeah, that's a crop burn in northeastern Victoria. So, yeah, they will gather. They seem to be able to see smoke from a long way away and be, being high up in the air when they're searching. They, um, yeah, they'll all key in on a potential source of food. Um, so courtship feeding, yeah, like like a lot of the large falcons, the male will feed the female in courtship. He'll bring food to the nest or a perch near the nest and feed her. Um, and they also share a kill away from the nest when... Um, yeah, the female seems to somehow know where to, where to find the male when he's got food. Um, as far as predators go in, in their behaviour, the, um, uh, black falcons are a bit susceptible to nest predation. They, they sometimes lose eggs and probably chicks to things like corvids or crows or ravens. And um, there's an occasional record of a black falcon being killed, surprisingly, by a peregrine as well as by a wedge-tailed eagle. I think it was probably a female peregrine got them male black falcon that was wandering over unusual habitat um, um so i'm happy to move on to a bit about breeding if if people are yeah okay i see there's a question there I'll, I'll get on to breeding so um they they use a stick nest of another species okay so that they they require a, a vacant nest or they'll sometimes try to usurp a nest of a of another species typically a crow a raven or a, or a or a hawk or an eagle, they occasionally use an old wedge-tail eagle nest even. So anything from the size of a crow upwards that, that builds a reasonable sort of stick nest they'll occupy. That bird in the photo there is occupying a nest that looks like it's probably built by a fairly large raptor um, or um, large corvid. Um, so typically in an emergent tree with a good view, alive or sometimes a dead tree in, in woodland or in a solitary tree, um, they lay, they're quite early breeders. They lay surprisingly early, like in about mid-winter, which is July for us in the Southern Hemisphere. They, they are laying eggs typically around about July or so, um, at least the peak of laying around that sort of July, August. Um, <clears throat> um, they, so they're fledging. I mean, typically they're fledging in, in sort of early spring, around, around sort of um, late September or mid-spring, sort of into October. Um, the clutch size, they lay anything up to five eggs, one to five eggs, but usually about between two and four eggs. Um, the female does most of the incubating, but but the male will share incubation when he brings prey. When she's off feeding on prey he's brought in, she, he'll take a share. Um, incubation period is about 34 days. Um, and the young are in the nest um, for about 38 to 42 days. Um, Males tend to fledge just a little bit sooner than females. So, um, yeah, we've got some photos of uh, chicks there. So they start off quite downy, of course, and then they progress to being well feathered. The ones on the right there are, are getting close to fledging. They're probably at about five weeks old there rather than six on the, on the right. Um, <clears throat> um, so again, parental behaviour during the breeding cycle, the male's doing most of the hunting and, and early on when the chicks are downy, the female will be brooding them. But again, if she's off dealing with prey that he's brought, he will take a, a short stint at brooding and he'll sometimes feed um, the nestlings bill to bill as well if she's absent for any reason for a few minutes off hunting or, or stretching or whatever, he'll, he'll sometimes feed the chicks as well. Um, so when they leave the nest, uh, the chicks are dependent 
on food for nearly a couple of months. They they still fed by the parents for about seven to eight weeks, and they disperse at about ten weeks after fledging. Um, in during which time, of course, they're practicing hunting, and and towards the end of that seven or eight weeks, they're accompanying the foraging parents um, and learning by by experience as well as perhaps imitation how to how to catch prey. Um, so um, yeah, there's a couple of photos there. Um, there's fledglings on the left there, and one getting fed on the right. There's two parents on the right there, and one of them's feeding a fledgling builder bill. So the parents even sometimes feed them that way after they've fledged, although they, they often give them whole prey as well or part, part prey and partly plucked. Um, ah, there's a question there about malt. I didn't really go into malt because it's it's actually in the Birds of the World account, but it's, the juveniles look pretty similar to the adults anyway. There's not a lot of difference. Um, they're just a bit darker and sort of a, a sootier brown. As far as we know, they, they molt straight into adult plumage at about a year old. Um, but some adults, it seems like um, the adults themselves do have a bit of plumage change as they get older. Like they, some of them seem to develop a bit more barring and speckling, um, like barring in the wings and tail um, and a bit of speckling on the breast. Um, and the, the pale throat may extend um, over a period of years as well on the adults. Um, but yeah, there's not enough done on um, on change of plumage from, adult, from juvenile to adult. Um, unfortunately, we've only had one re band recovery of a bird that was 12 years old um, banded as a nestling. And there was no record of what its plumage looked like when it was 12 years old because um, the specimen wasn't kept it was a road a kill or road injury that was um mercy killed and um it didn't end up in a museum or anything so we don't know um exactly what uh plumage change has happened through adulthood but it's quite likely that there is an ongoing change um but they're, they're mostly pretty dark anyway um through life um uh right I have a few questions from the Q&A on breeding while we're still on that topic. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So Lucille in the Q&A asks, are insects a big problem for the nestlings? There seem to be many insects around the nest. I I think she might be talking about like parasites and other sort of things that hang around nests. Um, oh, yeah, I see what you mean in the photo. I Oh, yeah. As far as I know, there's not a not. A, I mean, they'll get flies coming to a bit of carrion around the nest. If there's uneaten food, there'll be some flies. Um, there is a parasitic fly that sometimes uh, manages to um, lay an egg on a on a nestling that um, the larva will, will burrow into the 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 roots of a growing flight feather. But um, I haven't heard of them being a major problem. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't think that's a cloud of insects around that nest. It might be just a a, a issue with the photo or the screen or something, but um, yeah, to my knowledge, there's, there's not a major problem. Well, of course, flies are very abundant in the Australian inland anyway, um, of various kinds, mainly sort of bush flies and, and house flies. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't have enough information on that particular subject. But the adults, of course, um, will catch flying insects, mainly mainly grasshoppers and locusts and beetles and so on. Um, as a supplement to the diet and the the young ones when they fledge they'll they'll start catching insects before they can catch anything bigger um yeah hopefully that sort of answers the question yeah thank you i'll, I'll ask uh one more from the q a before we move on to and more topics um so uh where did it go uh janice asks is is it common among falcons in general that males tend to fledge before females or is that something unique to black falcon? Yeah, I think it's pretty normal. It's just because the females are larger and they grow a little bit more slowly or they take a little bit longer to reach adult size and uh, body size, that is. And, yeah, I, the males just seem to me to be a bit more adventurous and agile as well. Um, so it's pretty pretty normal, I think, in, in large, the medium and large falcons at any rate. And, um, yeah, but it's only a matter of a day or two. I mean... 
you know, the, the, most of them are fledging around about the 40 day mark. Um, you know, some males might fledge at sort of 38, some females might linger in the nest till about 44. And it may also depend on hatch order and, and how people measure the nestling period. Um, yeah, so per bird, it's probably pretty close to the, the 40 day mark, but um, um, they hatch almost synchronously. So they fledge almost synchronously as well. Um, but yeah, there might be that spread of a day or two between when when the last um, one leaves the nest versus the first. And in, in a big brood of four, the youngest one might also be a little bit um, slower to develop if it's not getting as much food. So yeah, there's various reasons why a large brood, there might be that spread of fledging dates. Mm. Thank you. Um, are we? Can we move on? I guess. Um, yeah. So sure. I, I think um, I'll, I'll get to the sort of the demography or population section. Um, black falcons are single brooded within a year. They only have one brood per year. But if they lose a clutch early on, like if at the first few days of eggs um, in the nest, if they lose them, they'll they'll have another go. Um, so some of the later clutches are probably second attempts for the season, but they'll only rear one brood of young per year. Um, the nest success is pretty variable depending on the season and the location. It can be pretty low, like 40% or so in the sheep wheat belt where they seem to have a fair bit of trouble with successful nests to, um, you know, about 80% or so in some other areas. So the nest success is variable, but can be can be quite high in good seasons in the arid zone. Um, as far as their productivity goes, they can fledge up to four in, in, in a brood. We've had a few records of four young fledging, but the average is more like about two and a half. Um, so again, depending on the location and, and the season, um, the sort of annual average productivity it, it varies between about, on average, one and three young per, per pair per year. But um, if there's drought, they won't breed um, in the arid zone. Yeah, they, they just don't breed in the drought in a drought. So yeah, a bit variable um, annual productivity depending on season and location. Um, there's a few factors that affect their breeding success. Um, nest predators, like I mentioned, they can lose eggs to, um, to the crows or ravens. Um, uh, storms or, or cold and wet weather can can um, yeah can cause nest failure. Um, <clears throat> the, occasionally, the um, young might catch a disease like the frounce or, or um, trichomoniasis from eating feral pigeons that are infected, especially around um, rural towns and so on, where they're hunting pigeons in towns. Um, yeah, I had one nest failure where the young one fell or was pushed out of the nest. It was feathered, but um, it was in care. It died and it was diagnosed as having frounce or what, what some people call canker in Australia. Um, uh, so longevity, we've got a couple of banding records of birds of three to six years old. And like I mentioned, there's one record of one 12 years old, but going by other falcons in the sort of sheep wheat belt where the, most of the data come from, the average might be about five years um, longevity. Um, Neighbouring nests in the areas that, that have been studied, that generally something between four and 15 kilometres between neighbouring nests. But there was one exceptional case of only 700 metres where the, where the nests were separated by a hill so that they couldn't see each other. Um, they did, if they're in the air, they did interact and defend each other's boundary. But yeah, that nest was um, was visually secluded and they probably hunted in opposite directions, I imagine. Um, so home range, as far as we can tell, just from observational records of known our known breeding birds, they... Uh, might have a home range of about 50 to 100 square kilometres because they range that we know of about four to six kilometres from the nest when they're hunting, but probably go a lot further, but we just don't know because they haven't been tracked. Um, and the density in the areas that um, I've been studying them, they might be a pair to about 100 square kilometres, something like that. Um, so the population trend, of course, is one of decline. I mentioned um, that they're declared vulnerable and they... they uh, declining in, in the southeastern Australian agricultural zone at least. Um, and that decline of sort of more than 30% um, 
reporting rate in, in our national bird atlas schemes qualifies them for, for vulnerable. Um, uh, 30 percent in that's in over three falcon generations which is calculated to be about six or seven years I think um, for a, yeah a generation of falcons um, so um, if people are ready I might just move on and mention a few threats um, to the population um, I'm, I think that yeah the habitat degradation and clearing um, there's still clearing for agriculture and and other developments in Australia and um, there's a lot of feral animals that have various uh, impacts on habitat, degrading the habitat. Um, uh, one of the issues in the sheep wheat belt is is the loss of um, the mature riparian trees, you know, on creeks and rivers. The old eucalypts, um, we're losing them; they're, they're dying. Um, um, yeah, there's this rural tree decline happening um, in a lot of farming districts. Um, they do have <clears throat> competitors and predators. They, they um, crows and ravens will, will um, compete for nest sites. So, um, the falcons like to use an old raven nest, but I've had cases where ravens have caused nest failures and, and um, black falcons to move um, to another nest site. Um, they'll they'll fight over a nest site. Um, surprisingly, the large cockatoos, like sulphur crested cockatoos, I've seen them. Um, try to pull a nests apart the, when the falcons are not there they'll sneak in and try to pull the sticks out of the nest and I, I assume that's to deter the falcons from being in the area because the, they do prey on cockatoos although there's not no records to my knowledge of them actually managing to subdue a sulfur crested cockatoo but they certainly take smaller cockatoos so and the cockatoos are quite smart and recognize predators and and peregrines can take the occasional sulfur crested cockatoo so yeah there's that issue of um overabundant uh competitors in in rural landscapes because cockatoos are very abundant where there's spilt grain and that sort of thing um yeah we still have wetland drainage and you know diversion of rivers you know and that sort of thing um uh fire is a bit of an issue in the tropics uh with the grazing you know cattle grazing regimes um the fire regime affects um the prey populations um, and in the inland, um, there's an invasive grass, buffalo grass, that um, burns very fiercely and, and can destroy uh, mature, like veteran um, riparian trees. Um, and then we mentioned the collisions already, um, roadkill and fences and so on. And um, yeah, I haven't heard of any window strikes, mainly because black falcons don't hunt all that much around around cities with skyscrapers, but they certainly hunt in rural towns. Um, uh, the, the chemical issue, um, black falcons weren't, um, they didn't suffer significant eggshell thinning from DDT, probably because of their diverse diet and they weren't, um, um, yeah, they they weren't eating enough birds to um, for the DDT to get up the food chain to them and they eat a lot of reptiles and, and rodents and so on as well. But um, rodenticides have become an issue. We, we have mouse plagues, uh, introduced house mouse forms plagues from time to time, and, and the knee-jerk reaction is to want to spread rodenticides around the country when there's a plague on. So, um, And because black falcons sometimes uh, eat um, juvenile rabbits as well, they, um, the pindone is used against rabbits, which is also an anticoagulant um, poison, uh, um, yeah, black falcons could uh, ingest pindone if they're eating rabbits. Um, and insecticides, yeah, locust plagues are often treated with insecticides, so there's a potential there. And lead poisoning, because black falcons will um, eat a bit of carrion or um, catch hunter-killed prey, they could be ingesting um, lead shot and, and be... Uh, poisoned by lead, but we don't have any data on that. We we know that wedge-tailed eagles um, are at risk of lead poisoning, um, but other smaller raptors probably are as well. Um, so if that sort of covers uh, threats, um, as far as management goes, um, oh, okay, straight. Oh, vagrants. Okay, I just saw that uh, question from the panellists. There's one record of a black falcon in New Zealand, um, but there's a bit of doubt about how it got there. 
Um, it wasn't wearing any falconry paraphernalia, but there was a rumour that it could have been an escaped falconer's bird. But um, from time to time, other other raptors get across to New Zealand, like Kest our Kestrel, Nankin Kestrels have colonised um, New Zealand under their own steam, and so so have barn owls, and um, our, well, harriers, obviously swamp harriers got there. Um, so that, that black falcon could have, um, yeah, made its own way to New Zealand. That's that's the only extra liminal record I'm aware of. And the only one that's in the literature is, um, yeah, the New Zealand one. Um, I, have a, I have a few more questions relating to threats yep. that uh, apply sure. to black falcon. Yep. So one is about fire. And so we, you know, in the international community have heard about like, increasing bushfires and forest fires in australia and so uh can you elaborate? sorry sorry you you broke up there yeah there's oh. i think our internet connection is uh is letting us down there but yeah look the bushfires the big bushfires in australia were mostly um burning um forest country so that that wasn't such an issue for for black falcons um yeah uh so I missed I missed parts of the question. Can you still hear me? No, that that that's pretty good. If if forest fires uh don't uh impact black falcons as directly, I think that was uh pretty good uh for that question. I do have a few more sort of in the general threats topic. Um mm -hmm. uh, so uh Pauline in the QA asks, uh, do you see an impact on black falcon? uh from farmers baiting for mice um <clears throat> nothing documented but but we managed to head off one one proposal in the last big mouse plague there was a move to um sort of put blanket um i think it was bromodialone around the countryside and that was that was blocked um yeah i uh, there's certainly been mortalities of other other birds of prey, other raptors from um, from the latest round of, of uh, rodenticide um, use since the plague. We also um, there also are people working on um, at the moment as as we speak. There are people doing um, uh, autopsies, like analyses of of uh, raptor carcasses, raptor and owl carcasses. So I, I don't know what the the present um, result is on that. Um, except to say that we suspected Pindone might have been affecting little eagles, but but so so far no little eagles turned up with, with Pindone in them. But um yeah, uh Rodiphacum and, and uh that's that seems to be the main one um of, of concern. Um there are moves to um to restrict um the availability of some of these second generation rodenticides to to licensed pest controllers, you know, with, with stricter rules on what they do with the with the baits and 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 the carcasses um you know the target carcasses so hopefully things will improve in that respect and and bird life australia is carrying a, a a big campaign against you know sort of just the indiscriminate private use of of second generation uh, anticoagulants right uh, um, one more one more that, question does that cover it? yeah Yep, sure. Uh, one more question, and this sort of gets into management, which you might be talking about next. So just feel free to dive into that topic. But the question mm. is, uh, is is there a possibility of artificial nests as a means of uh, helping black falcon populations? Um, well, uh, it's been suggested, but it hasn't been taken up. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think you know it'd be worth investigating if someone if someone was. Uh, keen to try it we we almost had someone wanting to do a phd on that in australia but that seems to have fallen by the wayside um i, I wish i could remember his name a famous um european worker on saker falcons um wanted wanted to try that on gray and black falcons um and i i, I sort of put a suggestion out there that that it might be worth trying um artificial nests in in our sort of sheep wheat belt for black falcons but yeah as far as i know nobody has uh taken it up um but yeah good good idea and, and it would be good to see it taken up 
Um, yeah, the only the only other thing I was really going to say about management um, was that um, at the moment the only the only real sort of uh, management happening is uh, black falcons are, are protected um, in the large sort of inland protected areas like na reserves like national parks and nature reserves and indigenous protected areas and now there's quite a few um, private um, reserved areas by um, the Australian Wildlife Conservancy and Bush Heritage Australia and so on and, and like sort of organisations where there's yeah I, I think at the moment the main thing that's being done for black falcons is sort of uh, incidental. It's just that there's a there's a growing number of um, large inland protected areas. Um, yeah, there's there's a little bit of hands-on rehab, but it, but that wouldn't contribute to the population as such. Um, yeah, and and I mean we we try to persuade people not to have barbed wire fences, but I, I you know it probably falls on deaf ears as far as um, livestock graziers go because it's just standard practice to have barbed wire on the top of every, you know, cattle paddock and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Any uh, any more questions on management? I'm, um, or will we move on? Or yeah, let's move on for now. And when when you finish your presentation, we can circle back and sort of hit some of the yeah. questions we may have um, not had yeah, time. Sure. For. Well, I was I was just going to mention. A, sorry, I was just going to mention a few of the, um, I guess a few of the research gaps or needs or whatever. Um, and and there's a there's a fair list in the Birds of the World page. Um, but yeah, I'd like to, you know, it'd be great to see some some work on home range and habitat use and move, movements by by telemetry and, and more banding. There's there's hardly any banding going on of black falcons these days, and um, no no telemetry yet. But it'd be great to uh, see that. Um, you know, some long term monitoring of of territory occupancy and and breeding pr productivity in some sample locations around the country. Um, some uh, yeah, we mentioned the comparative aerodynamics with uh, with peregrines. Um, and there's there, there's lots of other aspects of biology that would be worth looking into. That they're sort of flagged on the on the on the web page. Uh, it would be great to um, see some you know postgraduate student work on them, um, PhD or masters or whatever honors. Even there's um, there's good populations of black falcons within easy reach of of universities in Adelaide and Melbourne. And even maybe in in Queensland, like the, the the Darling Downs country in Queensland, would be within reach of some of the southeast Queensland universities. Um, and of course, ordinary observers can can, can contribute quite a lot. Um, uh, a, a lot of those colleagues and studies I mentioned were were done by amateur observers uh, collaborating. Um, so yeah, the, people can do some good observational studies. Um, um, and there's of course Atlas schemes like like eBird and and we have our own um, bird data which is um, BirdLife Australia's ongoing Atlas scheme, and there are state um, <clears throat> and federal Atlas schemes as well. Um, we have BioNet in New South Wales, and there's the the um, national um, Atlas of Living Australia. So there's lots of things that people can contribute to. Um, yeah, like I said, a lot of the uh, literature has been con contributed to by amateur observers. Um, at this point, I'd just like to say a big thank you to um, Jessica for putting together the slideshow and the, and the photographers that contributed. Um, a lot of them are, are in the Birds of the World account. Um, and David Whelan uh, supplied a few more for this, um, for this slideshow. So, yeah, thanks to all the people that uh, have helped make this uh, presentation and um, we can return to questions if people like if there's if there's time left we can uh, try to answer a few more questions absolutely we can do at least several more questions uh, we've got the time so I'm going back through the questions we may have uh, skipped over uh, in the Q a um, so one of these is pretty interesting and that's about how uh, Black falcon sort of fits into the broader landscape of raptors in Australia. Like there's a number of different species. Some of them 
some species are pretty similar to black falcon, like the brown falcon. So Sam asks, um, are there really significant ecological niche differences between the black falcon and brown falcon? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, the, the brown falcon has got, I don't know if people have seen photographs of brown falcons, but they've got fairly long legs. They they do a lot of perch hunting like a kestrel. A brown falcon, I guess the best way to think of a brown falcon is like it's an oversized kestrel and it does a lot of sitting on roadside posts and poles and, you know, dead trees and other things, that are, you know, on the tops of shrubs and so on in the inland. Um, and it does a lot of pouncing of, on small prey on the ground. It, it also eats a lot of reptiles. It's it's good at catching venomous snakes. So, yeah, the brown falcon is kind of our de facto um, snake eagle in a way. Um, yeah, it, it, it'll take on a big venomous snake and, and kill it um, and eat it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there, there are certainly niche niche differences, um, and the, like um, yeah, the the black is the same weight as a peregrine, but it hunts in different ways and probably um, different habitats generally. I mean, peregrines are fairly localized mostly to cliffs in Australia and and um, so on. Um, yeah. Uh, and of course, it, uh, black is um, <clears throat> a bit bigger than a grey falcon. A, a grey grey falcon, the female would be about the size of a male black, and the you know, male grey they overlap. I mean, the black falcon overlaps with all the other falcons, but um, in in range and distrib in distribution and so on. But um, yeah, there are size differences which which translate to different um, size prey they can take. Um, grey falcons are almost purely a bird specialist. Um, so, uh, whereas blacks are a lot more generalised, um, uh, hobbies, uh, Australian hobbies are quite a bit smaller. Although they take a lot of birds and insects and 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 um, small insectivorous bats. So there's yeah, there's a size difference there. Um, yeah, but definitely um, yeah, niche separation. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I just uh, saw a, a a thing pop up about falconry then um, and rehab. Yeah, in some states. I think I mentioned it in the in the web page actually, but um, yeah, in some states uh, it's permitted to use um, like falconry or free flying techniques in rehab. But New South Wales is dragging the chain on that. Um, there's a few myths floating around in the sort of government service about about uh, yeah malimprinting and starvation rations and so on, which are which are rubbish. But you know, <laughs> the bureaucracy is what it is, I suppose. Um, but yeah, some states allow the techniques to be used in rehab. Mm. Great. Um, yeah, I so just, any more questions? I have, um, a, I have a few more questions. So people were really uh, interested in the topic of uh, prey and hunting. So there's there's two questions yeah. here about um, specifically about robbing behavior. And so one question, yeah. do black falcons always rob in flight? And the follow-up question is, do they change uh, their so, sorry. So, so uh, do... I'm I'm sorry, um, Nick. I just lost. The, I just had a message flash up that the internet connection is unstable, so I missed part of that. You okay, up uh, there. I, I I can repeat if you can hear me now. Yeah, yeah, it's better now. Thanks. Okay, so so the, so do black falcons always rob prey from other raptors in flight? And the second part is, do they change their robbing behavior based on drought or other environmental conditions? Um, well, the, the first part is, um, yeah, a lot of the robbery is in flight, but but they're also pretty good at um, dominating a carcass. Like if they come to a, like a dead rabbit or something, they're pretty bold. So they're able to do both. They, they, yeah, a lot of the robbery I've seen has been in flight, but but they they are also capable of dis displacing um, raptors up to about their own size or a bit larger, like a whistling kite or something. They, they can actually dominate or intimidate other raptors at a carcass on the ground because yeah they they'll they'll swoop in and behave aggressively. They're quite they're quite aggressive falcons when they want to be. Um, yeah. Um, and was so, there, there was there another robbing... part to that? Yeah, so the robbing behavior, is that something they do more uh, in times of drought or difficult, oh, uh, tough conditions? Yeah, look, I, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Um, I, I've, I've certainly seen it happen at various times, and and um, I don't think anyone's really quantified it, but 
but um yeah I, i've seen them robbing during the breeding season i, I saw one rob a, a black shouldered uh, i mean a black kite once of, of a probably a a human discard like a bone or something and it and it it, it grabbed it from the black kite and then, then it apparently inspected it and then dropped it and thought it was not good enough to take back to the nest but um yeah fresh carrion like in another case um yeah there was one robbed a, a fresh roadkill east in rosella from a from a whistling kite that had picked it up and it took that to the nest i think but they're pretty selective um they don't take carrion to the nest generally um um in at other times of year i, I suspect um i suspect yeah it, wintering birds um yeah um juveniles or, or first year birds that are um they'll readily rob other raptors yeah so i think it's an all year round thing and, and um maybe maybe uh yearlings that are honing their hunting skills might might indulge in it a bit more than breeders because breeders often bring their own caught prey back to the nest as far as we can tell mm. All right. I think we're at our hour mark. So I think How are we going for time? I'm happy to take any more. Um, I think we are at time today. It is five o'clock here in Ithaca. So we've reached our hour. Um, thank you so much, Steve, for sharing your expertise with us all. And thank you, everybody, for the really great questions. Um, sorry we couldn't get to them all. Uh, but we do have a, um, you can always contact us through our contact form if you would like us to send some some more questions along. Um, yeah, Sorry, that's Jessica, that, the internet connection let me down again. You broke up there. So. Oh, <laughs> so no problem. Anyone... We're just wrapping up. So um, that's all the time we have today on this topic. Um but keep an okay, eye okay. out. Well, thank you. thank you. Thank you again to the team and to the audience. And, and um, yeah, visit the page if you want more information. Yeah. Um, our next webinar is going to be on February 22nd on the topic of storm petrels. So keep your eye out on your email for a link to register for that one. Um, I believe that's on Thursday as well. Um, and we will